Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Fresh Take episode. I'm delighted to introduce our CEO and today's moderator of the conversation, J.B. Holston. Thank you, Jenna. And uh, thanks very much for organizing this. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you at uh, our current Fresh Take. I'm delighted to have as our guest today, uh, Jamie McDonald. Jamie, hello. Hi there, JB. Uh, th this is going to be a fun conversation. Uh, we're probably going to be completing our sentences because uh, a lot of uh, Jamie's journey to do her work and mine have uh, some similarities, which will be fun to talk about. Let me do a little bit of an introduction and then we're going to dive in uh, on uh, questions. Jamie is the CEO of Upsurge Baltimore. Uh, she's an experienced entrepreneur, movement builder, speaker, and workshop leader. Prior to joining Upsurge, she was an advisor to global entrepreneurs, social innovators, impact focused executives at companies, organizations, and philanthropies. We'll talk more about Upsurge, Jamie, but a little bit for the, for the audience. Upsurge Baltimore launched in 2021 to found, support, scale, and invest in high impact startups. Upsurge is a public benefit corporation. I'll talk a little bit about that with Jamie, working to propel Baltimore into the top tier of innovation cities. The mission is to do more than just build the next great tech city. It's building the country's first Equitech city. And it'll be fun to talk a little bit about how uh, Equitech is defined. One thing uh, Jamie and I have in common is that she worked from the age of nine. I might have started when I was eight or so, um, although I did not have such a such a great name for my little business as Tiny Tots Tumbling School. <laughs> uh, but obviously an inveterate entrepreneur for the, the long term. Also in 2011, Jamie co-founded and became CEO of GiveCore, a crowdfunding and community building software platform that was acquired in 2014 by Network for good, one of the nation's largest online giving software uh, platforms. Long history in uh, private equity uh, as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about your background, but Jamie, thanks again for joining us. It's great to see you today. Thanks for having me, JB. Great to be here. Great. So uh, in order to start off with the disarming kind of question, uh, the, the, uh, what was your favorite takeout food over the last, uh, the last year? And then, and then more importantly, uh, other than uh, joining Upsurge, what uh, any particular small business up in uh, Baltimore that you were trying to support during uh, during COVID? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, my um, my most passionate um, hobby is cooking. So I we we do some takeout, but I have to say, I what I have really you know in COVID, I I've always love to cook, but I've probably never had more focus on cooking when we couldn't go out. And um, so, you know, I've done a, I, I've done more cooking in the last two years than, um, than I had for the 30 years prior to that. And I also had my kids with me for a period of time during COVID. So back to having a house full again, like when they were younger. Um, but, but if I have to, you know, there, there are almost too many great takeout places in Baltimore to mention, but certainly, um, Eki Ben, Bodhi Tav Tavern, which is a great Thai place in Hamden, um, Clavel, which is an incredible, um, also a, an incredible entrepreneur who owns Clavel and a number of other restaurants mm -hmm. in Baltimore, uh, is a great spot. So, you know, take your pick. Baltimore is, uh, we're just really fortunate with that incredible food scene. Um, and then um, small businesses, boy, that's pretty much all I support. So yeah. I'd, have a, I'd have a hard time picking. Um, I really, really try hard um, to, you know, to buy local and, um, and particularly kind of the are made in Baltimore, built in Baltimore, small businesses. Um, and, I, and again, we have a really thriving small business culture in Baltimore, so lots to choose from. And I would welcome any of your listeners up to Baltimore for a tour of all these amazing places at some point. That's great. Well, we can start doing that now. So we will uh, yes. we'll, ha we'll have to follow up on that. And uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sure one of uh, one of the folks listening has, has took down the names of those restaurants so that we can make sure to have those on the tour uh, when, we, uh, when we go up. Um, you know, you've had quite a personal journey, and I'd love to just uh, hear from you a little bit about what brought you to this work, because uh, you've clearly done lots of different sorts of things, and not everyone uh, tries to end up being a sort of um, servant leader in, uh, in, in the public benefit space. So talk a little bit about what brought you here uh, to this work, Jamie. Sure. I, I mean, I kind of think of my life like so many um, of us who are in our mid-50s. I've had a 
you know, if it's a book, I've probably got a book with four or five significant chapters. And, um, you know, I spent my, my growing up life in Philly. Um, so I'm a city kid from, you know, split my time early on in Center City and then in South Philly uh, in the 70s. And um, in the 70s, the South Philly, the thing that is a picture people can put in their minds was sort of like the movie Rocky. Like that was my neighborhood where I grew up. Um, and, you know, I was, a, I was a kid who always, um, always had a lot of interests and from sports to, uh, to, to school and academics. And, um, and so that's, you, you referenced my first little business. I, I was a gymnast growing up and I, you know, and I, I, that's how I got to start that, that tiny tots tumbling class and was able to buy myself a few things that my mother couldn't afford. So it was a, it was a great okay. lesson in the value of entrepreneurship, but ultimately I came to Baltimore after graduate school. Um, and, you know, my, that first period of my career, the first 17 years, pretty significant amount of time. Nobody stays in jobs 17 years anymore. Um, but I was at Alex Brown and then Alex Brown merged with Bankers Trust. And then ultimately we were acquired by Deutsche Bank and I was there through all of that. Um, I, I spent the bulk of my time when I was at Alex Brown covering what today we would, as a broad category, call private equity firms. But back in the day, we called them venture and leverage buyout funds. Um, we, you know, we were, um, Alex Brown was a national specialty investment bank. We had a focus on seven industries and, um, and a global footprint in those seven industries. And, um, and what we realized, you know, when I was relatively early in my career there was that, you know, our relationships with private equity funds were a huge pipeline of business for us. And, um, but at that point we had no organized effort to cover them. And so I did the background work working with, um, with a couple of our senior folks to figure out what that structure should look like. And then they ultimately asked if I would take that on and lead that with another colleague. So that was what I did for the bulk of my time at Alex Brown had, you know, an up close look at both the, you know, the, the startup world at that point and, um, Sorry, I'm turning off my Slack notifications. I thought I did this, but I've got many workspaces. I'm very sorry. Um, and but also obviously got to see, you know, the private equity landscape um, up close as well. And um, and and at that time, I mean, it's so different today because one, the country is just a wash in money um, in the private equity world. They, they can't deploy funds fast enough. Um, and, but what it means is um, it's both a blessing and a curse because, you know, it's people, they have to, to make an impact in their portfolios, these funds have got to put bigger chunks of money to work at a time. So there's a lot we could talk about as it relates to that, because that's very relevant to cities the size of Baltimore as they're thinking about how to grow a startup economy. Um, the next phase of my career, I became an entrepreneur. Um, and you mentioned my second company, which a company called GiveCore that I started um, with a colleague in 2011 and sold in 2014. Um, and because of the nature of the work we were doing there, um, we were doing civic engagement and community building. I got connected with the early hashtag social movements. You know, we today we sort of take that for granted, yeah. but in 2012 and 2013, we still would get a lot of questions about why you're putting a pound sign in front of your name, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, um, and what? So one of the um, one of the the hashtag movements I got connected to was Giving Tuesday, um, very much in that community building giving space, and um, and when I when I left and. Um, after we sold the company to Network for Good, I stayed on for a year and then I went out on my own and I sort of took what I'd learned in that movement building world. I'd worked at that point as just a partner with Giving Tuesday for a number of years, um, but realized that the practices of movement building that were redefining how social impact was happening in the world were incredibly relevant to companies as well because um, we were already starting to see, we didn't have language for it, but we already were starting to see that companies that thought more about community than customers grew in a different way. And so the, the, the best example that most people understand is, is Harley Davidson, 
right? Harley has always been a company that has thought more about community than customers. And that they didn't call themselves a movement, but in many ways, what they what they showed, you know, many other companies was that there's a there's a stickiness to your relationship with customers when you actually think about them as a community and not just connect them to you, but connect them to each other. And a lot of that movement building sort of learning that was starting to really become codified in the social space, I was able to take from the lens I had there and really work with a bunch of companies on how to think more like movements. Um, and so that was sort of that next phase of my time. You know, I, I worked as an advisor and speaker and um, did a zillion workshops and a lot of Zooms before everybody else in the world was on Zooms and, um, and was really having a great time doing all of that, working with folks around the world. Um, but when COVID hit and I, like so many people started to think not just about what did I wanna be thinking about if I was sitting on eight hours a day of Zooms, but also what's the mark I wanna leave in the world if we're sort of looking at a potentially changed world on the heels of COVID. Um, and I, my heart kept pushing me back to Baltimore, that that's the place that I care most about in the world. I also think Baltimore is a place that um, is just such um, an unpolished gem in many ways that just needs a little buffing and you know it can truly be a model for the world. And so I started really connecting with some of our both grassroots civic leaders and our corporate leaders in Baltimore. And from a whole series of conversations over the course of about six months, Upsurge was born. And that you know brings us to today. So, um, so Great. four chapters, and and I couldn't be more thrilled to be focused on what I'm focused on now. Great. Well, thank you for that. And you know, as as Upsurge goes from chapter to book, you can you can uh, you can publish that volume. But uh, let's talk uh, more, if we can, Jamie, about Upsurge. And uh, um, you know, feel free, of course, to share that slide if that's useful. But I think. Um, you know, Upsurge as a private benefit corp, as an investment vehicle, the corporate partnerships to it, it's your, your effort to kind of help Baltimore um, become as known as it should be in the innovation economy. All that is, uh, is really interesting and, uh, and, and relevant. So I'd love to, love to hear more about how you talk about what Upsurge is, what you can share with the group about um, how they should think about it. Sure, yeah. And so I will actually just pop up one slide um, because it, it, it's helpful, I think, to see this picture. So, um, so you mentioned in your introduction that our aspiration is to be more than just the country's next great tech city. Um, that alone would be a laudable aspiration. So taking nothing away from the cities around the country, you know, for whom that is a focus. But, um, you know, but as I really thought about my experience working in cities across the country, you know, the thing that is so striking is how, as so many of the country's brain hubs have really um, built momentum, the people who have been left behind are often the people who are the natives of those cities. And so in, you know, in places like San Francisco and Austin and Boston and Seattle and LA and New York, um, you know, most of the participants in the knowledge economy there are people that are either from somewhere else or people who weren't from somewhere else, but who were, you know, had a pedigree or were a set of privileges that gave them an easy connection into those knowledge economies. And so those cities, while they in, on many measures are thriving, they are also in most instances, the most wealth, most wealth divided cities in the country. And so as we thought about the way that we wanted to build Upsurge, we felt like it was important to really think about um, you know, how we can redefine what it means to be a thriving startup city. And in many ways, I think that we're very um, timely in our aspirations because this is where the world is going. We're just gonna be the first ones to actually do it really well. Um, and so, you know, so we, we created this sort of lexicon um, with Equitech as our defining vision and what Equitech means is, you know, that we aspire to build the country or the world's first truly inclusive tech economy. And so what that means is we have to think beyond just 
companies. And so that's this this image that I'm sharing um, sort of puts it all into a picture. So the four core things that we you know work on day in and day out are on the left hand side here. So one, we have to nurture and grow the companies who are here. Um, you know, I, I say all the time, you can't have Equitech without tech, right? You have so you've got to start by building that tech economy that um, that is flourishing in Baltimore. And we have an incredible start. I mean, Baltimore is already, by many measures, a top ten tech city. We have unbelievable anchor institutions, which I know we we're going to talk about a little bit later in in terms of higher ed and corporate. Um, leaders and um, and then a thriving small business community. Um, and we have um, a, a legacy base of investors who are here and new investors who are launching funds in Baltimore because they see the opportunity here. So that's really the, that's that top box. The second box is that we want to play a role attracting and investing in companies directly. And so we've partnered with Techstars to launch the first global Equitech Accelerator here in Baltimore. Um, we've got some other Techstars news, which will be coming in a couple of weeks. I can't really talk about now, but uh, that will continue to build on our work with them. Um, and we anticipate down the road other potential direct investment vehicles that can be housed under Upsurge's umbrella that are all propelling this Equitech vision. Um, the third piece, which has to happen simultaneously, and I think that these two bottom boxes are really what distinguish our approach to what has happened in the other cities across the country, is that we are simultaneously working with Mayor Scott's administration um, and with partners across the city on two bodies of work, one around pathways. So how are we building more points of um, of intersection into the knowledge economy, more points of access into the knowledge economy for Baltimoreans? How are we making sure that starting all the way down with our middle schoolers, that we are demonstrating that the knowledge economy is, a, is an aspirational path in the same way that so many young Baltimoreans think of as media or, you know, or athletics are an aspirational path. We want them to see startups in the knowledge economy as an aspirational path, but then we have to deliver on the other side. So we also have to be working with our companies to say, what barriers do you have in place that as we have a base of, you know, talent ready for the knowledge economy in Baltimore, that there are jobs on the other side that they can get and grow in. And so we've got an incredible partner um, group in Baltimore called Baltimore Tracks, which is a group of almost 30 local startups that have committed to um, a series of changes in their hiring practices, like eliminating degree requirements and recruiting in different places and sharing candidates so that qualified Baltimoreans have a higher likelihood of being able to connect into the knowledge economy and find those high quality jobs that we're gonna promise them. Now, this is a long-term vision that doesn't take, you know, that doesn't change overnight, but, but we're working on that with intention right now. I have a person on my team who does nothing but think about this. Um, the other side of that is the underlying policy work that we, again, are working on with, um, with Mayor Scott's team to make sure that as, um, you know, as our knowledge economy grows and as our talent and workforce grows, that we're thinking about what those policies around real estate education and transportation are that can undergird, you know, the acceleration of the ecosystem. Um, and then the final thing, and this I think is where we're really breaking a lot of new ground, is um, we have a core um, a core value that underlies our Ecotech vision that we call Prosper in Place. And so we think of this as our anti-gentrification approach. So um, what happens in so many other places um, is that as the, you know, the tech economy grows um, and you are building a burgeoning workforce often imported from you know, other places. So again, this is where our pathways work hopefully starts to counteract some of this import. Not that we don't want amazing people from other, we wanna grow from within and from without. Um, but often, you know, if if it's a if it's a token person who is um, able to access the knowledge economy and they start to build, you know, accumulate some family wealth, they may decide like I don't want to stay where I am because I don't want to be the only person on my block who's, you know, 
who's beginning to build wealth for their families. I want to sort of live in a neighborhood with other people who are experiencing what I'm experiencing. And so what we've been thinking very deliberately about is how do we create the opportunity for more Baltimoreans using technology? And so one of the real sort of deep dives we've been doing with some partners on the West Coast is where can blockchain and real estate ownership potentially come together so that more Baltimoreans can, in essence, own a piece of their block, own a piece of the apartment building that they might be renting in, so that they're building wealth at the same time, hopefully, that they are finding these better quality jobs that move them from just sustenance as a family to family advancement, and then ultimately to you know, economic freedom. So, so the prosper in place pilots are a really critical part of this. And so if, if you just follow this chart, the rest of it is pretty obvious. So if we do those four things well, what happens is we start to really build velocity we scale our pathways and our policy work. We start to tell this story across the country of the unique thing that's happening here. And then as you carry that whole vision forward, five, eight, 10 years, um, you know, Baltimore fulfills this vision of not just being a thriving, diverse innovation city, but a model for the country and the world. And that is in a picture what we are trying to do. Yeah. Well, that's great. And, uh, you know, as I know you and I spoke before, but a lot of echoes to what we were able to do, um, you know, in Denver over the last 20 years, but with with um, with equality and uh, inclusion and, and diversity at the center of your work, um, which is, I think, something that Denver is seeking to do to a greater degree um, now. Um, as you mentioned, you know, lots of the innovation hubs that have sprouted up um, got to that late. I, and I think that what a lot of these cities have learned is it's hard to retrofit it. And that's why we felt like it was really critical to do it from the beginning. And Baltimore is a city with a, you know, incredible base of, you know, diverse, brilliant people. So we are a very logical place to be the groundbreakers on this. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we share, obviously our remit is regional Baltimore through Richmond, but I think a lot of what you just mentioned about Baltimore applies to this region generally, you know, it's got a strength of diversity, it's got a ton of tremendous assets. And I think if it, you know, our, our certainly view has been that growth is a direct function of inclusion right now. And so the more all of us are collectively focused on inclusion now with all the work, um, and it seems like a moment in time when there's a lot of support uh, for that. Jamie, let me talk a little bit about uh, Upsurge as a construct or as an investment vehicle. I know it's a it's a public benefit corp and, and you've gotten a lot of support from lots of um, you know, the major institutions in the region. Um, talk a little bit about why you formed it as a public benefit corp, if you would. And then sure. also, um, if you would, you mentioned the Techstars connection. Maybe talk a little bit about what the um, your supporters are investing in, because obviously you've got a vehicle and then it has other vehicles as well. Um, I mean, really everything is under one vehicle. So it's um, just just not to confuse people, but so so we, you know, we evaluated a lot of different possible structures um, and where we landed and the, the rationale for the public benefit corp, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a corporate structure that exists right now in 10 states and is rapidly being adopted in other states. Um, was really pioneered on the West Coast. And, um, and the, the rationale for us, and I think there are different reasons that people choose to become public benefit corps, but the rationale for us was that um, we wanted to be able to encompass our broad ecosystem mission, but also wanted the flexibility to have some investment vehicles that were mission aligned. And so the Techstars Equitech Accelerator is the first investment vehicle that falls under upsurge investments. But we anticipate um, in 2022 that we'll launch a national Equitech prize, which would be another um, investment into one or potentially a couple of companies that fulfill our Equitech vision, but that decide to locate in Baltimore. Um, and then there may be other kinds of, you know, pools that we'll want to work with others to partner um, and bring to Baltimore over time. And so our aspiration is not that we become fund managers. We think of it more upsurge investments will operate more like a fund of funds where we'll look for very strong mission aligned fund partners who are either looking at investments in underestimated entrepreneurs or are looking at investments in sectors 
um, that we think are particularly germane to Equitech. So for example, you know, we, we talk a lot in Equitech about it not just being about underestimated founders or companies grounded in diversity, but the third category of Equitech companies is companies whose technology itself is increasing equity. So there's a whole series of companies like um, there are insurance companies that are cropping up right now that are looking at how actuarially to evaluate people with non-traditional backgrounds in new ways so they can provide good insurance. There are credit rating software companies now that are looking at how you can use character versus you know, pure numerical data to assess someone's credit worthiness. We think of those as Equitech companies. Nearly any healthcare technology that is either increasing access or reducing cost is an Equitech company, right? So, so, so the so, so we think that there's an opportunity to have these other investment vehicles um, under the upsurge umbrella in sort of a loosely a fund to fund structure. Now we're not a fund, and we're very clear about that. But that, but conceptually, that would be a way for your listeners to think about it. Um, the other rationale for the structure is. Um, as much as I have worked with and am an intense admirer of the work of nonprofits. Um, I believe that the nonprofit funding system is broken and that it tamps down innovation, that it prevents nonprofits from being visionary and strategic, um, and that the power dynamic between funders and nonprofits, um, not universally, but can be um, unhelpful in actually driving change. And so that might not be opinion some people like to hear, but that's my view. And so I did not want to be on the sort of nonprofit hamster wheel of having every three years to re-justify my 10-year vision. Um, and, and so we felt like this structure also allowed us to be self-sustaining um, because we should have returns sufficient to you know, allow us to continue to to do our work in the long run and to maintain this visionary long-term aspiration. Um, and we also wanted a vehicle that all different kinds of people could participate in. So the public benefit corp structure allows us to have both grantors and investors invest in us. Um, and they don't choose between the investment side and the ecosystem work. Everybody that comes in, comes into this pooled public benefit vehicle. They invest in both. Um, so. So that was the rationale, and um, you know we're six months in, so <laughs> we'll 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 see if it fulfills our expectations over time because it is not you know it, it's still not a widely used structure, so we don't have a ton of um, of long term examples to to look at to sort of understand what the pitfalls might be, but we feel pretty optimistic about the structure we've developed. Great. Uh, if you can maybe talk a little bit about some of the organizations that have stepped up to support. Um, you mentioned, I know, some of the higher ed um, foundational institutions in the region, but a number of the corporations uh, as well. Yeah, so we have um, we have uh, 11 or 12 supporters at this point, um, meaningful supporters. Um, our, our lead investor is um, Point Field Partners, which is Steve Bishotti's family office. Steve Bishotti is the owner of the Baltimore Ravens. Um, Brown Advisory, T. Rowe Price, Greenspring Associates, Whiting Turner, um, Continental Realty, Johns Hopkins University of Maryland, Towson University, and on and on the Able Foundation. Um, you know, there, so we have foundation, corporate, and, um, and academic partners all in our, um, in our supporter group. And you know we are we're still you know we're we're sort of still out there in the in conversation with quite a few other partners. We've had we've got a lot of momentum. We've got a lot of even in six months we've had some pretty significant um, successes. I guess I would say I don't I don't want to sound boastful, but we've you know we've we've done a lot of work in a short amount of time to really start to build some velocity in the ecosystem and just some alignment of interests and focus. Um, and so you know so we're 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 continuing to build that base of support both locally and with some potential national partners as well. That's great. Well, that's a tremendous amount of momentum in a short period of time with some really big names. Um, 
I, I was very involved, um, you know, like you, I was involved uh, in created a thing called the Colorado Impact Fund, uh, about a $65 million fund about, boy, it's probably eight years now, whatever. Um, and a lot of the conversation then with the supporters ultimately was this question of return versus benefit and uh, social impact. Uh, how, how have you been having that conversation with your investors now? Have things matured to the point that they kind of get get that or is that something that you need to you need to help them understand as you um, as you as you pitch them on first yeah, i mean look it, it's not a because of the way we're structured and the fact that we're not the ones you know we're not like picking individual companies you know it, so we're not a you know we're not direct investors um but techstars has a track record that they that we can point to that's over the you know it's over thousands of companies and um and right now since they're the initial you know, anchor investment vehicle, you know, we can talk about the potential blended, you know, returns between our, our operating and overhead and, um, and then what the, you know, the investment in tech stars should yield. Um, and, you know, as other investment vehicles come online, you know, again, because we are not looking to create things from whole cloth, that those other investment partners will come in with a track record that we'll be able to articulate. And, um, and we've got a, you know, we've got an advisory board that's got a lot of thoughtful people on it. Um, and, you know, and we, we've got a smaller group that, you know, will evaluate those future partners um, that are, you know, expert investors. And so I think that we'll, you know, we, we, the conversations are not super complicated because it's not like we're coming up with some unique investment thesis and hiring investment professionals and doing all the things that a fund would have to do. Um, you know, we are partnering with other experienced, you know, funds and essentially using that relationship as a way both to fulfill this Equitech mission, mission attract companies to Baltimore and encourage them to stay and grow here. And by virtue of that work, our investors get some kind of return. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about higher ed. And if, if you think back to the map of uh, that you started with, um, higher ed obviously has lots of ways they can yeah. contribute um, or in some cases can slow down the effort to really accelerate um, an innovation economy. Talk a little bit about that in the, in the, in the, in the Baltimore uh, region. Yeah. I mean, I think here they are nothing but accelerators. Um, you know, they, so we, we have um, Baltimore, I think, depending on how you define whether it's the city or the, uh, or, or the city and the seven counties, we're either number one or two in the country in terms of um, most colleges and universities per capita with Boston. Um, and so we we are so fortunate to have, you know, incredible universities from obviously Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland, the largest, but Morgan State University, Coppin State University, Loyola College, UMBC, um, Goucher. I mean, you, you know, there are, we, we just, we have a, you know, a, a base of, um, and our, our ter terrific community colleges as well. Um, so we have an academic base in Baltimore that is, you know, really peerless for a city our size, and um, and they are deeply engaged in our work. Um, they intersect and impact every stage of that chart that I showed, um, because they are um, they're developing sciences that can be commercialized. They are, um, you know, they are ambassadors for Baltimore out in the world. They're mentors and advisors to companies. They're commercializing technologies, you know, out of you know Johns Hopkins Tech Ventures and the Baltimore Fund at the University of Maryland and the Biopark. Um, in many instances, they create centers of excellence around industries, so that if we're attracting a company to Baltimore and perhaps they want an expert in um, in some kind of cyber engineering, like we have that in spades here, and so. Um, you know, so so our I think, you know, in our case here in Baltimore, our academic institutions mm -hmm. are really embedded in everything that is happening in the innovation economy. There are certainly innovation economy leaders here, um, well before Upsurge ever existed, and um, we could not. I don't think we could do what we aspire to do um, without the partnerships with them, um, and in particular, I think one of the really you know, perhaps less known things about Baltimore's higher ed 
um, community is that we have two historically black colleges, Morgan State and Coppin, within the city limits. We have UMBC, which is just a couple minutes south of the city. And um, those three, you know, Morgan and UMBC in particular, are the among the top two or three schools in the country for graduating black STEM graduates. Um, and, you know, and so the town and Morgan in, in terms of engineering is the top school in the country for black engineers. So, you know, so we, we have some strengths in our academic ecosystem that contribute to um, the power of our eco, our, of our Equitech vision and the talent pipeline that can be part of really fueling the kinds of companies that we hope will choose Baltimore as a home or get launched and grow in Baltimore um, that are just different from other places. And so we really see them not just as powerful overall innovation partners, but in particular, when we think about the Equitech vision, we think we've got strengths that are very different from other places. Um, let me ask the same question in the context of the corporate supporters um, of the organization. Uh, obviously, they can provide financial capital uh, to move things forward. But how else do you think about the role they've got to play in uh, delivering on this 10-year vision? I mean, again, there's, you know, we're we're fortunate because our direct supporters are digging in with us in a whole range of ways. Other corporate partners in town um, you know, we're, we're still engaging with even, even as we continue to talk to them about, um, you know, the sort of the broad aspirations of upsurge and how they can participate. But, you know, I really think about the relationship with, um, with corporations and a thriving startup community as very symbiotic, because I think big companies need the, the that sort of energy and dynamism and boundary pushing that small companies bring to a business ecosystem. Um, for direct things like corporate development and that kind of thing, but for, you know, even less, you know, I think in, if you think about our, our brain hubs across the country, um, you see big companies moving to the places that have big active startup ecosystems, right? Because they want the energy of those like edge thinkers that you find in startups. Um, also, in in cities where there's a really dense base of startups, you tend to also see strong arts communities, strong writer communities, strong food communities, right? A lot of that tends to go hand in hand. So they also can create, you know, cities with great quality of life. Um, so I think from our corporate partners perspective, they will see benefits from a growing and accelerating startup community, both, you know, like economic benefits, but also intangibles that make it a better place to grow as a company, to recruit new talent. Um, and then in terms of direct opportunities to partner, our corporate um, you know, workforce can be experts. So we're tapping into roundtables, for example, of marketing experts, of HR experts that are willing to um, hold office hours for startups that can't afford to have an in-house HR person, but they need 20 minutes of somebody's time once a month to get some advice on how to you know, think about approaches to things. Same with lots of different skills. So operations, HR, marketing, legal, there's a whole bunch of those kind of just specialized skills that until a company is series C or beyond, they typically aren't having you know, dedicated in-house people providing some of those kinds of, um, of skilled resources. So that's one place we really see our corporate community um, playing. They can invest in companies. They can be advisors and mentors to companies. They can host companies for lunch, get to know you lunches. They can be customers. They can be pilot partners. So one of the things that we've seen has been really, you know, powerful in a lot of other places is, um, is that a company will, you know, San Francisco has been really good at this, that their big companies will be pilot partners for their startups. And Denver, I think also has actually had some real success with this where um, a young technology, you know, they, they need a real live pilot to see how it's working. And so that large company can actually pay to be a pilot partner help really get an early look at a new technology, but also give the kind of real world feedback that a startup needs to be successful. So lots and lots of ways that corporate partners can both benefit from a thriving startup community and contribute. 
Let's talk a little bit about the broader region. I know you're obviously very focused on Baltimore and that immediate region as well. But um, if you think about the broader region, um, obviously our remit is Baltimore to Richmond. We define it that way, or as I call it, um, given that I was in Colorado until relatively recently, the front range of the middle Atlantic. And I'm, no one so far has uh, taken me up on that proposed uh, descriptor. But if you think about the broader range, uh, the broader uh, region, Jamie, what are what are some of the strengths and weaknesses um, of it more broadly? And uh, you know, do we need a sort of an upsurge DC and an upsurge Richmond? I mean, how, how do you how do you think about um, the broader the broader geography as well? Yeah, it's a you know it's a really good question because I know that we that that things like this term DMV and obviously what you guys are thinking about with um, you know the the Baltimore Washington Richmond you know area. You know, I think it's tricky because I think that the you are talking about both cities and then their surrounding, you know, suburbs and um, you know, and then the rural areas that are between them that are all quite distinct. Um, Baltimore is very, very different from DC, which is very different from Richmond. And um, and so while I would say it differently, I you know I'm I think it would be great if there was an upsurge in all those places. But what I would more like to see is that Equitech becomes a vision for the greater region. Um, that we see that um, you know that that we could be taking what we're gonna you know we're gonna pioneer in Baltimore. We're gonna do a lot of learning here, um, and then you know, we can take what has been learned here. And I think, you know, our goal is not to hold Equitech close. Our goal is that Equitech becomes the ubiquitous approach to building startup communities across the country. We're just gonna pioneer it in Baltimore and create the model that the country can follow. Um, so, you know, so when I think about the broader region, you, you know, I think that, that there are assets and strengths that, that exist in each of these cities that we should be thinking very deliberately about how to leverage across the region. Um, I also think that the entire region would rise if the region thought more about Baltimore and the vital role that Baltimore could play in sort of anchoring the north end of the region. You know, I think in a lot of ways, people in, in DC think, you know, Maryland ends at Montgomery County and, you know, they don't really think beyond. Um, I don't mean that of you, but I think that that's, uh, I think there's some real DC bias there. Although interestingly, um, you know, one of the, in, of the dynamics that we're dealing with right now that's challenging in Baltimore actually is that, um, you know, DC's real estate market has been so, you know, pricey that so many Washingtonians are moving to Baltimore <laughs> and kind of pricing Baltimoreans out of the market here in some communities. And it's it's something that we're we're seeing. It's it's great to have a little bit of that mixing and exciting to, you know, to see people that realize that we're, you know, 25 minutes on the Acela and 40 minutes on the Mark train, you know, so it's pretty easy commute from Baltimore to DC and vice versa. Um, but you know, but what we would love to see is that, you know, Baltimore has, you know, as um, the same kind of economic growth, the same kind of, you know, stature among the, you know, the three cities in the region and really is viewed as sort of, the, you know, the, 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 the northern leader of the region in the way that Washington is the central leader and we hope Richmond is viewed as the southern leader and so we would love to we'd love to draw on the strengths of the entire region in support of Baltimore. Great. Well, thanks for that. Um, as we predicted at the start, we're um, we're of course at time uh, sadly. Um, but uh, just uh, to one last question and one comment too. I, I'd commend to anyone who's interested that they subscribe to the Upshot, your uh, mm -hmm. your newsletter. I think it's just a terrific way to um, to both get a sense of the vitality and also keep track of some of the great things that are happening up there. Um, my last question. I know this may not be as short as we've got, but um, you know, if you, when you look back ten years from now, what will success look like? Yeah, I mean, look, one thing about vision is, you know, you have to, 
you've got to be realistic about the idea that you have to, you have like a broad concept, but like we've got a, it's a community driven vision. So we're going to take it where it, where it goes with the support of our community. But essentially what we hope we see is that Baltimore is a hub for companies led by underestimated founders. Um, that we have the country's most diverse tech workforce, um, that we have a, um, you know, more Baltimoreans accessing more high quality jobs, but being able then to invest back in their neighborhoods and improve their neighborhoods and prosper in place. Um, and we will be written about in journals across the world about how an inclusive tech economy was, was built. Yeah, well, that's terrific. And, uh, you know, obviously the partnership is in support of all of those objectives for all the reasons that you just mentioned. Our, you know, our hashtag has been inclusive growth, but um, but we'll, we'll we'll be promoting Equitech more certainly um, as, as one as well. Uh, Jamie, thanks so much for the time today. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Uh, continued good luck for, uh, with Upsurge. My guest has been Jamie McDonald, the CEO of Upsurge Baltimore. Thanks very much, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Great. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.